Happy Resurrection Sunday 2020. We're glad that you're worshiping with us. We're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're having a great morning today. Happy Resurrection Sunday. You know, the reality is the world is a little bit different these days. And so our service is also going to be a little bit different as well. We're going to bring in some interviews. I'm going to have a chance to interview some of our uh, fellowship family, some people from outside of the fellowship. This morning is 100% about the empty tomb. So I want to get started this morning by reading from the Word of God that teaches us about the empty tomb. If you are familiar with the Word of God, this is the voice of the angel speaking to those who found the tomb empty on Resurrection Sunday morning. Uh, here's the word of the angel to the women who found the tomb empty. Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, and then go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, and see, I have told this to you. My friend, I want you to focus in like you have never focused in before, on the words of the angel to those ladies, do not fear. Just as the disciples, just as the followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, in that context, in that time when they were filled with fear and amazement and unknownness and they didn't know what was going to happen, the angel spoke a clear word to them, do not fear. My friend, my brother, my sister, can I speak that over you this morning? Whatever the circumstances of life may be, the tomb is empty. Do not fear. One of the things that we want to do this morning is to have some special interviews for our special Resurrection Sunday service 2020. And so we're going to do that now. Our first special guest has been around the fellowship for a long time. Uh, he is not new to the fellowship. And if you've ever seen the choir sing, you've probably seen him. And uh, he probably doesn't need an introduction but I am blessed to know him. And you, if you know Rick Devins, you are blessed as well. If you don't, it is my honor, it's my privilege to be able to introduce Rick Devins to you now. So hold tight while I see if I can get him on the video chat. Hold on one second. Hey, Rick, thanks for taking time to join us. Happy Easter. I hope that you're having a great day today. Happy Easter, Zach. Okay, so I have like four or five questions that I want to ask you uh, that are serious questions. But before I do that, I want you to play a little game called Easter Quiz. Are you willing to do that? Of course. All right. Four questions, for four questions, and um, here's what we'll do. I'm going to ask you four questions, and, okay. well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to wait to tell you what the reward is until I see how good you do, all right? Question one, what did Jesus leave behind in the tomb? Was it nails from the crucifixion, grave clothes, or a copy of the prophet Isaiah? Close. Grave clothes is correct. John chapter 20, verses 5 through 7 says that they stooped to look in and he saw the linen clothes lying there. And then Simon Peter came following mm. him. He went into the tomb and he saw the grave clothes. You, my friend, are one for one so far. Question two. Of the followers of Jesus, who was <laughs> the first to discover the empty tomb? Who was the first to discover the empty tomb? Was it Luke? Was it the Apostle Paul? Or was it a group of ladies? Mary, Mary, Salome, and Joanna. Oh, it was a group of ladies. I group remember them. ladies. Ding, 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 ding. Correct. You are now two for two, my friend. All right. Question three. When the empty tomb was discovered, 
What was the reason people were going to the tomb in the first place? Was it to paint the large rock that covered the entrance to the tomb, to anoint the body of Jesus, or to plant flowers at the entrance of the tomb? To anoint the body. Correct. Very good. And so you're three for three. Uh, Rick, last question. Which disciple said he would not believe the resurrection until he touched the wounds of Jesus? Was it Thomas, Matthew, or Raymond? Thomas. Thomas is correct. You got them all correct. Way to go, Rick. Good job, my friend. Good job, my friend. Well done. Hey, okay, so those that's just a fun little quiz, uh, but... Let me ask you a couple of questions while I've got you here. First of all, um, when you get to heaven, what is the first thing that you right now would want to say or do when you see Jesus? I got to be honest with you. I'm, uh, what comes to mind right now mm -hmm. is just uncontrolled weeping mm -hmm. of joy. Mm. And I really mean that. Yeah. That's just uh, uncontrolled weeping of joy. Yeah. Well, we're going to see him one day. That's the good mm. news of today, you know, the, the empty tomb. Um, let me ask you this question. I ask you this, Rick, because oftentimes people think that <clears throat> the resurrection is like this theological doctrine, and we know it and we believe it, but it, maybe it hasn't really impacted our life. So I want to ask you this question. How has the empty tomb impacted your life on your job? Two things come to mind, and I say in a lot of ways, um, since... I'd love to sit here before you and tell you that I'm the perfect employee and I try to do everything right and I go to work every day um, and walk away every day saying, that was a great day. I really changed. I really walked with the Lord, and but I don't. And there are days that, but what I will tell you is that the conviction of the Holy Spirit on my job, at my work, is there all the time, whether you get caught in a situation where, you know, you just might be caught in a conversation that isn't quite right. You might be, end up being something like that. Mm -hmm. And I will tell you that the first part of the answer to me is that um, the empty tomb, the risen Christ who lives in me, uh, convicts me often um, and I would say the second part to me is that being a follower of Christ I on my particular job I run into a lot of different people which I love and There's somewhere, and I'm not sure where it is, but Jesus said, love all men as I have loved you. Mm -hmm. And I've bumped into very wealthy people. I've, it doesn't matter to me if you're the person who's leading meeting in the boardroom or the person that's rearranging the chairs afterwards. I probably have learned more in life, and I mean every word of this, from the person who's rearranged the chairs. And they're just as valuable in, in the eyes of the Lord as the person leading the meeting. Um, I hope that makes sense. No, it does. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Um, another question is, what would you say to somebody who believes in God, maybe even 
believes that the tomb is empty, you know, accepts that Jesus did rise from the dead, but has never surrendered their life to Christ or has never uh, given their heart to Christ. What would you say to somebody? Because there are people who are watching right now who will be in that situation. They believe in God, but they've never really um, experienced the life that Jesus can give to them. What would you say to those people? And I've been there. I've been there. I, I believed in God all my life. I can't think of a time in my entire life, my entire childhood, any time in my life, I can't remember not believing in God. But it wasn't until my mid-20s that someone shared the gospel with me and told me about salvation and told me about Jesus was a, was a good person to me. He was, I believed in him, but he wasn't Lord to me. He wasn't, I'm not sure who he was to me. I, I believed in who he was, but um, there's a couple of verses in Romans that uh, were presented to me, and it said, uh, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and that was me. And um, I was also told about the wages of sin, um, you know, that I was asked where I wanted to spend eternity. And um, that there was nothing that I could do, nothing that I could do. I could be the nicest person in the world. Mm -hmm. I could give all the money I had away. Um, and that wasn't enough. The... It was the person of Christ, the sinless, faultless person of Christ who was my substitute for my sin. And that made sense. And um, I put faith in Christ, and I've been walking with him ever since. And so, yeah. You know, I believed in God all my life, but it wasn't until my mid-20s that I started following Christ and was saved. Mm. When I put my faith in Christ as my Savior. Amen. So when did you start singing in the choir? Because I, I introduced you as somebody who's been in the choir for a while. How long have you been in the choir? That's a great question. We... Moved to Easton in 1986, the end of 86. And we attended another church for a little while and were kind of intrigued by the fellowship and started coming here in early 87. And I have no idea how long I've been singing in the choir, but some of my richest blessings have been singing in the choir. As, I, as you mentioned that, I am just rolling over in my mind, singing alongside Lauren Johnson and George Willis and yeah, so many other people. Yeah, and out of all, having a good, good time. We really had a lot of fun. <laughs> what are some of your favorite Resurrection Sunday? Jesus has come out of the tomb. What are some of your favorite Easter songs? You gonna sing them with me? No. <laughs> well, there's a there's a couple that come to mind. Um, you know, the hallelujah chorus is hard to do, and I'm not going to sit here and try to do it by myself, but Christ the Lord is risen today, hallelujah, sons of men and angels say, hallelujah. Raise like him, like him we rise. Alleluia. Christ has opened paradise. Alleluia. So that's one. That's um, awesome. Good job, brother. No music or anything. Acapella. Good job. I don't know if I got the words right. Uh, 
Well, one of my other favorites is, I'll try another verse. But <clears throat> because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Man, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a good one. That's a good one. You got any others? We got time for one more if you've got another one in you. Usually on Good Friday, for many years, uh, as part of the service, we, we, uh, I, I, I will sing, were you there? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if I can, I'd, I'd, I'd like to. I, I think I speak for everybody in the service, at the service, watching the service. We would love that. Uh, it's very, very meaningful to me. Um, for a lot of, uh, you know, if I happen to get a little choked up or something, uh, please don't tune out. <laughs> but, uh, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Oh, Sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when the sun refused to shine? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Oh, sometimes. It causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they laid him in the tomb? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Were you there when he rose up from the dead? 
Sometimes I feel like shouting glory, glory, glory. Were you there when he rose up from the dead? Hallelujah. You know what I love about um, not just hearing you, but watching you sing is that you can see the love that you have for the Lord uh, coming through. And I really appreciate that about you. I appreciate you too, brother. Well, listen, we're going to go. I want to say thank you for singing for us and uh, with us and leading us in a little worship today. You did a great job on your quiz. And I hope you know, brother, that I love you so much. <laughs> One of the things I appreciate about Rick is that he loves the Lord and it's clear whether he's at the church or whether he's on his job. He just has this authentic relationship with Jesus and it shows. And I want you to know that if you've never experienced that, you can have that too. It's not just something that's for Rick. It's for all of us. And, uh, and speaking of worship ministry and speaking of songs, I want to just move right to our next interview. Uh, this also is an interview with somebody who is a regular on our worship team. I am grateful, grateful, grateful that Mike Monroe has agreed to be interviewed. And so we're going to interview him now. Hold tight again and see if I can find him on the video. Okay, we got Mike here. Mike, first of all, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for allowing us to interview you. Happy Easter. My question for you is, are you willing to take the challenge that I call Name That Song? Are you willing to play a game with us? Uh, yeah, I hope I'm okay, though. All right, here's what we'll do. I'm gonna, we're going to play four rounds. Uh, I'm going to give you the lyrics to the song. And all of these songs talk about the resurrection of Jesus. So I'm going to give you lyrics to the song. You have to name that song. Question, uh, question one. Here's the first one. Uh, there in the ground his body lay, light of the world by darkness slain. Then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again. And as he stands in victory, Sin's curse has lost its grip on me. Name that song. <laughs> I probably sang that 5,000 times. You can hear it in your head right now. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right. And if you need a hint, I'll give you a hint. Yeah, give me a hint. In Christ alone. That's the name of the song, In Christ Alone. <laughs> I, was, I was going in my head. I was singing it. Isn't that interesting? In that Christ alone. You could have sung that whole song, couldn't you? And still yeah, I, time let me it. tell you something. I've, I've written lyrics pretty much for all the bands I've been in, and I can't remember any of them. That's so. why we're playing this game. It's so fun. It's so, <laughs> it's so stumping that you know the songs. Uh, <laughs> you all right, we're going, uh, we're going to a blast from the past. Here we go. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose. That's right. Christ arose. Uh, Do you need a hint? Uh, yeah, is that, is that the... Uh, I thought it was he arose. Okay, yeah, give me a hint. Up. From the grave he arose. With a mighty triumph over his foes. Yes, out from the grave he arose. All right, uh, number three. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom. But I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Uh, I got it. <laughs> All right. Uh, 
How about him? How deep the Father's love. love. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's that. It's that one. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. How deep the Father's love. Oh All my right. goodness. Number four. <laughs> There's how many of these? This is the last I'm looking, one. I'm looking really <laughs> bad here. <laughs> no, 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 no. This is the last one. Okay, but I. All right. Here it is. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. I can because he li I can face tomorrow because he lives. Oh, uh, because he lives. Ding, ding, ding. I'm doing that. I'm, oh, I'm, very good. Very yep. good. Very good. All right, Mike, you did a great job. We won't tell you what your score was, but anyway. I got two out, of, two out of four. That's half, I guess. Yeah, that's right. Like, like it's like you're half, you're, you, got, you got at least half of them. So I think yeah, exactly. I, I try to look at the uh, glasses half full. Absolutely. I think you deserve a prize. Hey, pivoting from, pivoting from fun to, I want to ask you a couple of serious questions. One is, so as a pastor, I, I don't want to say I struggle with, but I deal with a lot as I'm working with people and talking with people, they tend to think of biblical truths, and, and we're talking about the resurrection today. So we, we tend, sometimes we tend to think about the resurrection as a theological distant truth that hasn't really impacted life. And so as a brother in the Lord who um, goes to work, has a family, has friends, has neighbors, I just want to ask you this question. How has the empty tomb impacted you, like, let's say, at your job? Um, well, first, it just very much, um, it reminds me that this life on earth that we live is temporary, mm. that our true uh, home is in heaven. Mm. and. So that helps with the perspective. I have to say it's very difficult sometimes, though, in that because you're actually here living through the through this life, through this pandemic. <laughs> so um, but also in that, it uh, reminds me that God wants all uh, everyone to have a seat in heaven, to have a place in heaven with him. Mm. So it reminds me that I need to tell them and and talk to them you know those people that are closest around us and work is one of them yeah. uh that god loves them and that he wants to have a relationship with them and that he wants to have them with him in heaven mm -hmm. so it just it kind of makes it hopefully it gives me more, a little more boldness to to talk to people at work, you're talking about work. So people at work about Jesus. Yeah. I asked this question earlier with somebody else. I want to ask you this question as well. Um, in our culture, there's a ton of people who believe in the existence of God, but have never really surrendered their life to following this Jesus that walked out of the tomb. And inevitably, like for sure, there are people who, you know, who are tuned into the service who are in that boat. You know, they they uh, believe in God. Maybe they even live like a good, according to them, a good moral life. But they've never really surrendered their life to Jesus. What would you say to those people? Well, let's see. I, I have a ton of them <laughs> in my life. Um, I would. Well, it's, it's actually like a it's really a two part question because first I'm assuming that, um, you know, we know them, you like, so talking on one side with people that, you know, mm -hmm. talking family, friends, um, coworkers, like we just talked about, mm -hmm. that's an entirely different conversation than it is with someone you don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I will talk about the ones that you do know. So already you have a relationship with them. So, if they don't know that you believe in Jesus and you go to church and you and you are active in your music ministry or whatever ministry you may be doing, 
then I would say you need to start looking inside and say, what, what am I doing? <laughs> what am I not doing that these people don't know that I'm different? Mm -hmm. So that right there should be a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes what you just them looking at you and observing you is a huge factor because it should open up conversations. Um, and I just think, uh, I know one thing I won't do, won't do and I don't do is I don't beat them over the head with the Bible. I just, I just don't. Um, I will have discussions and I'll maybe gear it towards it. Um, but that is a huge factor when people know God. The huge issue is they don't know Jesus. And that is a, that is a tough discussion with a lot of people because for whatever reason, just maybe they've been brought up and I mean, how much of is it's, it's that kind of statement that you don't know what you don't know. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them just don't know that Jesus is the only way mm -hmm. they've been taught that if you're a good enough person, if you're better than the other guy, yeah. you can, you can get there. And um, so that's a tough discussion. Yeah. So you talked about uh, worship ministry and music ministry. I shared with everybody before we pulled you in here that you're on our worship team. So what are the chances, Mike Monroe, <laughs> of just between you and I and everybody watching that we could get a song out of you? <laughs> I think I could give a shot to one. All right. I, uh, yeah, I, have, I, have a few, I have a few favorites and... Um, I just wanted to say, like, one of, one of my very, I actually sang it at the fellowship um, a few years ago. It was called uh, He's Alive by Don, by Don Francesco. So that's always been one of my favorites right there. Mm -hmm. uh, I Will Rise from Chris Tomlin has always oh, been man. another one. I love that one. Call, I Will Rise when he calls my name. Yeah, when man. Say I just, no more sorrow, no more pain. Yeah, I've, I've sung that at a funeral. Uh, for a really good friend of ours um and it was just i mean it's so uplifting yeah. and uh amazing grace my chains are gone i love that one i love the newer version with chris tomlin singing it just because I, I i don't know I'm, i just i just do because i love the chains are gone because for a long time i felt like that yeah i felt like i had these chains holding me and um but i would like to do one if that's okay with you yeah. what are you gonna sing i'd like to do because he lives be well i'll let you sing it <laughs> that was in that was in the songs that you asked me about earlier so if i didn't get that that would be really bad yeah, we would have to close the interview right <laughs> all right go for it mike all right i'm gonna give it a shot so um if i bug me i'll just turn it off god sent his son they call him jesus he came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior lives because he lives. I can face tomorrow because he lives. All fear is gone because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. How sweet to hold a newborn baby and feel the pride and joy he gives. But greater still, the calm assurance this child can face uncertain days because he lives, because he lives. I can face tomorrow 
because he lives, all fear is gone, because I know I have a future, and life is worth living just because he lives. And then one day, I'll cross the river, I'll fight life's fight, no war with pain. And then as death gives way to victory, I'll see light, the lights of glory, and I'll know he lives, because he lives, I can face tomorrow, because he lives, all fear is gone, oh it's gone, because I know And life is worth the living just because he lives. And life is worth the living just because he lives. Amen. Amen. Hey, I don't know any better way than to end our time together with that. Man, thank you so much. We've been to church. We have been to church, man. Hey, I love you, brother. Thanks for taking some time with us. I love you, too. And happy Easter fellowship. Bless you, brother. Love you, brothers and sisters. I love that song, Because He Lives, because it reminds us that our hope is anchored in the victory of Jesus, the salvation that we have, the hope that we have. It's not found in ourself because he lives, because he is victorious, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, I don't have to live with fear. Reminds me of a passage in 1 Peter chapter 1. This is verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I want to introduce you to somebody this morning. Uh, this brother's name is Joe. And Joe not only knows this scripture cerebrally or intellectually, but he's actually experienced it. He has experienced the living hope uh, that comes through the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to interview him this morning uh, for a number of reasons. But one, it was a year ago today that Joe Ferrelli uh, came down the altar at the Easter service and said, I want to surrender my life to the Lordship of Jesus. And so I thought as I was thinking through, who do I want to interview on Easter morning? I couldn't think of a better person to interview than Joe Ferrelli because it was on Easter Sunday that he surrendered his life to Jesus. And the empty tomb then became not just something that he believed, but something that literally transformed his life. So hold tight and let's see if we can get Joe on a video chat for, for an interview. Okay, I think we got Joe here. Joe, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Happy Easter. I, I wanna ask you two questions. The first one is share a little bit about your story because I know that like one year ago exactly, you went from believing in God to surrendering your life to the Lordship of Jesus. And so we've been celebrating that for a year. But one of the really interesting things about your story is the role that friends played in not only you coming to give your life to Christ, but also after you began to be a follower of Jesus for this past year, 
you've had some really important friends in your life help you grow in the faith. So why don't you share a little bit about that? Well, uh, as I said in my testimony, I never really went to church um, for most of my life. It's just a couple of years ago that I started, and I would, wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for uh, my good friend, Laurel, Laurel Murray, who I was getting a haircut one day, and she said, you know, she started going to church, and um, she asked me to go. And I think I said I'd go and probably made about four or five excuses and didn't go for the first month, <laughs> and she was relentless. Um, and finally, I, I went. And um, when I went, it was an amazing place because I, I, I immediately felt comfortable uh -huh. and I enjoyed being there. And then literally every week thereafter for quite a long time, I would get the, the text from Laurel, are we going to see you on Sunday? Are we going to see you on Sunday? She was relentless. And um, had it not been for Laurel, I probably wouldn't be here today. Mm. That was how I started. And then once I got there, um, I went to a breakfast meeting with with John Murray, he invited me to go to a, a, a breakfast um, meeting, and that's where I met uh, Ernie and John Lofstadt, and we had a nice conversation, and we were talking, mm -hmm. and at that point, Ernie actually called me out, and um, I was brand new to this, and said, you know, what's your relationship with Christ? Wow. And I, I was kind of taken back, and I said, well, I really don't have one. I'm, I'm pretty new to this, and that's when John Lofstadt stepped in, and began setting up the um the alpha program with uh liz cog and roy baker and john and then i started going to the alpha program so the four those four people are crucial and totally instrumental in getting me involved in christ mm -hmm. yeah yep and so once you because I, i'll never forget last year at easter at this time uh you know given the invitation and if people want to transition from believing in God to really giving their life to Christ and having uh, life in God and, and walking with God come forward and you came forward. But I know that even after that moment, because you and I had this conversation where, okay, so you've been reborn into the kingdom of God, but you need to grow and you need somebody to help you and people have helped you. So talk a little bit about the role of your friends in your life after you started following Christ as well. Well, after, after Alpha, um, I was, okay, I didn't have anywhere to go after, except for going to church. Yeah. So I still continue to this day meeting every week with John Lofsted. And we read the Bible every Wednesday or Thursday night. We meet for an hour at a nearby Starbucks here or there or a Panera. And uh, we read the Bible every week. And we do this to this day. Mm -hmm. um, so it's wonderful. We have certain passages that we read and we study and um, we speak and we talk and it's wonderful. So to this day, I still, you know, I go to my Sunday church, you know, at the fellowship, and then I meet with John on, on Wednesday nights. Amen. It's wonderful. So uh, talk to, you know, you're talking to me, obviously, but there's just tons of people watching and listening today. And I think it's a glorious thing to see somebody go from believing in the existence of God, which is important, but it doesn't save you. Like it doesn't secure your eternity in heaven with God. It's, it's a step, but it's not salvation. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are watching and I want you to speak to them because you were in this place for a long time. You believed in God, but you had not yet given your life to Christ. You haven't began following Jesus. What would you say to those people? Like any relationship, you have to be all in. If you don't, if you, you can just believe in God and everything's great, it's superficial though, it's on the surface. But until you surrender, you commit yourself, you're never going to have that relationship mm. with God. Mm. Now I have a relationship. Um, it was the foundation of my new life, taking that step and committing myself. Mm. Um, now I can, like, I feel his presence and I, and I, and I trust his love. Yeah. I didn't have that before. Yeah, yeah. You got to take the step. Amen. Take the step. Take the step. So if you're watching today and you're like Joe, you believe in the existence of God, but you've never surrendered your life to him. Uh, I'm saying, Joe is saying, everybody's saying, take the step. Hey, Joe, listen, uh, we're going to go. Thank you for taking the time to let me interview you and doing it in such a strange way. Usually we would do this on the platform at the church. So uh, thanks for being digital with me and being creative. I hope you know I love you, man. It's so cool to watch you grow in the Lord. So um, 
Yeah, just we'll leave it there. Thanks, Joe. And uh, we're going to close our time now, but thanks for uh, taking the time to meet with us. Thank you so much. Take care. You know, one of the things that I, you probably saw this, I really wanted to ask Joe about was the role of friends in coming to faith in Christ, but also the role of friends in spiritual development. And, you know, when you think about the story of the empty tomb and you think about how that news got to the disciples and then spread, you know, oftentimes in our context, we think in terms of who shares the good news? Well, the preacher does, right? And I wanted you to hear Joe's story because Joe's story is not that some preacher found him and won him to the Lord. Joe's story is that he just had friends that loved him enough to tell him about Jesus. And so I am so happy that we got to hear from Joe today. Talk about how the empty tomb transformed his life and talk about the role that his friends played in that transformation and in that process. But we have to be honest, don't we? We have to acknowledge that not everybody embraces an empty tomb. And, and, and if we're honest with ourselves, we will acknowledge, won't we, that there are some who would debate, who would argue, who would propose to us that Jesus didn't conquer death. He didn't walk out of the tomb. There's no such thing as the resurrection of the dead. And I think it's important in our culture and in the year 2020 for us to acknowledge and respond to the uh, vocalization or the objection of the Christian faith because some don't believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. So our next interviewee is someone who's going to speak to that. Chuck McCorder is a good friend of mine. Uh, he, he works inside of a college ministry where he works with young adults, teaching them how to think biblically, teaching them what is a Christian worldview, but also teaching young Christians how to defend their faith and how to give an answer uh, and defend what it is that they say that they believe in the Christian faith. So uh, hold tight, and I'm going to find Chuck, and he is going to give us an answer for how do we answer the objection of someone who would say, Jesus didn't raise from the dead. Maybe the disciples took him. Maybe the government guards took him. But certainly Jesus wasn't raised from the dead. Hold tight, and we'll see if we can find Chuck here online. Okay, we have Chuck here. Chuck, first of all, let me say thanks. Happy Easter. I hope that you're having a, uh, a great morning. And I do want you to take a second. I do have a very important question about the resurrection. But before we do that, would you just take just a couple of moments and share with us a little bit about your college ministry, what you do, how it's going, and I guess maybe even a couple of ways that we could pray for you about that. Yeah, sure, Zach. I appreciate that. So um, I work with an organization that's called Ratio Christi. Ratio Christi is Latin. It uh, means reason for Christ. And what our organization does is put academically trained apologists. That's someone who can uh, give a defense for the uh, claims of Christianity and we put those people down on university campuses. I, I work at Rice University here in Houston. Um, our ministry is going very well. We, uh, my wife and I just started a uh, campus chapter this year. Uh, we're working through some of the challenges just like everybody else is with now being virtual and not being able to uh, go out and shake people's hands and, and talk with them. But uh, we're still carrying on. We're still doing really well, and the Lord has blessed us well. Um, pray for our students. Pray that they would uh, have numerous opportunities to take the knowledge that we're giving them and boldly engage in evangelism and sharing the gospel with those around them. That's where we. That's where we need prayer right now. Amen. Amen. So we'll be praying. We promise. I commit to you not only to pray personally, but to invite the church family to pray as well. What I wanted to do, what I wanted to interview you this morning is, you know, this is Resurrection Sunday. Tons of people are celebrating. Everybody's enjoying the national holiday. But as I share with the church family, some people enjoy the national holiday, but they totally reject the notion of a literal 
and physical resurrection. Some people say that maybe the disciples took Jesus's body. Some people say maybe the government snuck in and took Jesus's body. So I just want to give you the floor to um, just to respond to that. Yeah, so the question is, is um, did either the guards or the disciples come in and steal the body of Jesus? And now they've, they've somehow created this conspiracy that uh, the Jesus that was crucified on the cross has now been resurrected. And so um, the way I would respond to that is, is, is the short answer is, is it, that is completely ignorant of the historical context that we have. When we look at first century Judaism, when we look at the historical facts that we have around the resurrection, and, and even when we get into what we call these 12 historical facts that we have, three of those are what are called bedrock facts. And bedrock facts are ones that historians unanimously agree upon. Um, to find a historian that didn't agree on one of these facts is to find someone who is who's completely outside of both uh, the, uh, theistic and secular uh, historical scholarship. And so we'll walk through some of that. Um, now the 12 historical facts that we have, just so that, that everybody is clear on where our starting point is, is coming from is the first one is Jesus died by crucifixion. And this is, this is one of those bedrock facts that, um, is agreed upon unanimously. The amount of historical information we have, we know that Jesus was a historical person he died by crucifixion. He was buried. The death caused his disciples, his followers, to despair and lose hope. These guys were scared. And that's a key thing about our question today. These guys were scared. They were in hiding. And, and they were not going around boldly pro proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah at that point in time. The other is that Jesus' tomb was found empty a few days later. We also know that each of his disciples had experiences that they believed to be the risen and literal appearance of Jesus Christ. That's our second bedrock fact that unanimously historians agree upon. The disciples were transformed from doubters into bold proclaimers. So you have these guys who were in hiding, who went from being in hiding to where we see the disciples in Acts, where they're walking up to the the temple, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus, getting beaten and flogged, and then coming out of the temple and praising God for, for their sufferings. Um, next, we have that the message of this resurrection was the central message of the church, and it's what the entire church started with and grew upon. That's a historical fact. The message was openly proclaimed in Jerusalem, as we mentioned, and but it's important to see in Jerusalem, that's where Jesus died, and that's where he was buried. It's not like this message started somewhere in Italy and then filtered back towards Jerusalem. No, it started right there where Jesus' body would have been if he were not risen. Sunday, which actually Saturday was the primary day of worship. Remember, this is all in a Jewish context. It, be, it moved from Saturday to becoming Sunday. You're talking about thousands upon thousands of years of um, worship that, that changed um, just in the blink of an eye because of this event. You had James, Jesus's brother, who is formerly a skeptic, and this is a key piece of information, boldly becomes a proclaimer of the faith. And then even more so, what we're going to talk about today is Paul was converted to the faith, Paul being a persecutor of the church, someone who had everything going for him, in an instant, on a road to Damascus, changes his entire life, throws it all away from a worldly sense to gain everything from an eternal sense and becomes a proclaimer of the gospel. So let's dig in. Now that we have those, those 12 facts, let's dig into um, what, we, what we know about uh, what scripture tells us and what we, what we know about the, um, the historical considerations. Any questions so far, Zach? No, I just, um, all that makes sense. So you're talking to right now, let's just pretend that I'm a skeptic saying, how do I know, number one, that the disciples didn't take Jesus's body? And, and if that's not the case, mm. 
how can I know number two that somebody, like you said, some of the guards, somebody as a governmental right. official didn't take his body. Right. And the reason I'm the reason we laid that historical foundation is because when we when we look at those facts, when we come up with an explanation for it, it has to meet those facts. Right. OK. Otherwise, we're inventing something into the story. And so if, if we take a look now at the guard objection. So how do we know that the guards didn't take it? Well, first, we need to understand where does this even come from? Where does this story come from? Um, the only mention of a guard is where we find in Matthew in chapter 27 and then in 28. And when we, when we look at this, the historical context of what's going on, saying that the guard might have stolen the body just makes absolutely no sense. First off, a failure by a guard, whether it be a Roman military guard or any type of guard in that day would have would have meant death, if not a very severe punishment like flogging for those guards. So for the guards to have some sort of motive to go and take the body and hide the body so that this new movement, this new religious movement could have started is there's, there's no motive there. They would have been sacrificing their lives for what? Two, but let's say that it was the, th the authorities Maybe the Jewish authorities decided to hide the body. Paul tells us in Corinthians that if, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're still in our sins. So if you want to prove that Christianity is wrong, produce the body. That's all you have to do. And the authorities were so set on stopping this movement that if they had the body of Jesus, they would have produced it. Because if you produce the body, there's no resurrection. If there's no resurrection, then there's no Christian movement, plain and simple. And so by, by thinking that either the guards or the authorities had, had something to do with stealing the body, it's, uh, it, it's, it makes absolutely no sense. Now, what about the disciples? Now, if you remember the, the, the facts that we had looked at, the, the key is, is that the disciples were in fear. They were in complete fear whenever Jesus died. They thought that this movement was over. They thought that his life had ended. What we would have to assume is that somehow these disciples gained enough courage to now sneak past these guards. Now, remember, none of these guys are, are fighters. I mean, Peter pulled out a sword at one point in time, aimed it for the middle of a guy's head, completely missed and, and got the guy's ear. Okay, that's, that's the best that we're working with here from a military standpoint. These guys would have had to sneak past the guards roll this heavy stone out of the way, steal the body, and, and then somehow conceal this body for, um, a, well, forever. Now, that's not, we, let's say that we can believe that. Well, then we have to look at what was their behavior afterwards. They changed from being in fear to now boldly proclaiming this resurrected Jesus boldly proclaiming this resurrection of Jesus to the point of being beaten, to becoming the most unpopular people in the known world at that time. Both the Romans and the Jewish community hated them. But even more so, putting it in a Jewish context, they had nothing that they were gaining. As a matter of fact, not only would they have known they were losing everything from a worldly standpoint, they were losing everything from an eternal standpoint if they were lying. We also have Paul, right? And this is one of the most convincing pieces of evidence that we have. Paul, who was a Pharisee trained by Gamaliel. This is like the Harvard of Pharisee training, right? He is the top scholar that Paul trained under. He was an up-and-coming Pharisee, incredibly zealous for uh, in his devotion. He was zealous enough to persecute the first church. So he's out persecuting this church, gets these orders to go and persecute the church. And yet what, by Jewish standards, he has everything going for him, everything going for him. And yet on this road to Damascus, something happens to where he is completely willing to throw all that away, not just stop being a zealous Pharisee, but to change what he's doing and become one of the the most prominent, outspoken, um, 
missionaries for this new movement to the point of being beaten, to the point of, of suffering immensely. And, and Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 11. He talks about how he's been whipped, he's been uh, stoned, he's been beaten, left for dead, so on and so forth, all the way to the point of being beheaded. And all he had to do, the only thing he had to do to stop all of this was just say, you know what, I've made it all up. I, I, I'm lying. Mm -hmm. And so when we look across history, we see how there's been a lot of people who have died for something that they have believed in, that they believe to be true. Mm -hmm. But when we look across history, we don't see people who give up everything from an earthly perspective, everything from an eternal perspective, and die for something that they would have known to be a lie. Mm -hmm. These guys would have known that it wasn't true. They would have known that they would have made it up. Mm -hmm. And so that's that's how I would I would approach that just from a uh, historical standpoint is that it's it it doesn't have what is called the explanatory scope it doesn't cover all of the different historical facts and it doesn't have the explanatory power it's not it's not the best explanation mm -hmm. for what happened yeah so Chuck I just have to say I love every single time I get to talk to you. <laughs> well, thank you. Likewise. I mean, Likewise. You just, my brain go all over the place with this stuff. Because you know, <laughs> as a pastor, talking with people who haven't yet given their life to Christ, I talk with people all the time, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who talk about these types of things. How can we even know he really walked out of the tomb? Well, you just explained why. So we've got to leave it there. I've got to run. But I just want to say thanks uh, may God bless you and your ministry, and please give my love to your family, all right? Will do. Likewise, Zach, and happy Easter to you and, and all of your church. Amen. Bless you, Amen. brother. Bless you. So Chuck has laid out for us just a, a very clear answer to the response of the gospel story that Jesus didn't raise from the dead. And as we think about responses, really what I want to do with the time that we have left today is to carry that theme of response and, and talk a little bit about that. So if the appropriate response then isn't an objection to the empty tomb, what would an appropriate response be? I want to share with you a couple of thoughts that I have uh, from the Word of God. I want for us to look at the scripture this morning. I know it's been a lot of fun to interview people and hear their story and hear them articulate how the empty tomb has influenced and impacted their life. But I don't ever want us to have a service where we don't open the word of God. And so what I want to do is to share with you three responses to the empty tomb. Uh, and, and the first response is actually the opposition to the empty tomb. And let me read the scripture to you. This is found in Matthew chapter 28, verses 11 through 15. It says, while the, while the women were going to spread the word to the disciples, some of the guard went into the city and they told the chief priests all that had taken place. They told them about the resurrection. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave these guards a lot of money. And here's what they said. We want you to tell the people his disciples came by night and stole Jesus away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and we will keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. So the reality is there are some people that understand the literal and historical resurrection of Jesus is true, but they still oppose it. And I, and I want to articulate that because I want you to ask yourself, what is my response to the empty tomb? You know, we've talked with Rick this morning and we've talked with Mike and we've talked with Joe and we've talked with Chuck and we've looked at the word of God about some, some other types of responses. But the question is, how do you respond to it? Do you respond to the empty tomb the way these guards and religious elders responded to the empty tomb by trying to oppose it, by trying to mislead people from embracing it and the implications of that? That is one, I'm, 
as I said this morning, I want to share with you three responses to the empty tomb. One of them is some people will oppose the empty tomb. There's another scripture uh, found in Luke, uh, Luke chapter 24. And the scripture says uh, here in, in Luke chapter 24, verse 12, that one of the disciples named Peter, when he heard that the tomb was empty, it says that Peter arose and he ran to the tomb. He didn't walk. He didn't trot. It says he ran to the tomb. And he stooped in and he looked in and he saw the linen clothes by themselves and he went home marveling at what had happened. And so as we think about different responses to the empty tomb, you know, the first one that we talked about was the guards and the way that some people will oppose the empty tomb. Uh, but some of us will be like Peter where we have this sense of need to investigate the empty tomb. And if that's where you're at, praise God. You know, I think it's a fair thing to say that you're not yet a follower of Jesus because you're investigating the claims of Christianity. The only point that I would make here is that when Peter felt like he needed to investigate, he didn't stay at home, he didn't forget about it. It says that he immediately got up and he ran to the tomb. He said, this is so incredibly important that I have to get to this now. I've got to look into this now. It can't be something that I just put off and get to when I get around to it. No, this was a of eternal significance. And so I would just share with you this morning that if you're at the place in your life where the empty tomb is something that you need to investigate because you're not yet ready to surrender your life to Jesus, then investigate it. You know, there's a famous guy named Thomas. He was one of the disciples and he's been come to know as he's been come to known as Doubting Thomas. Because when he learned about the resurrection, he said something powerful. He said, I'll never believe the resurrection until I see Jesus and I put my fingers in his wounds, in his hands, and in his side. He said, very provocative thing, a very profound thing. He said, I need to investigate this. I need to look into this. I need to know that this is real stuff. So it's okay if, if you're at that point in your spiritual development where you need to investigate it. I praise God that you don't put yourself in that category in which you oppose it. Maybe you are investigating it. And if that's you this morning, praise God. My challenge to you then is to really, truly investigate it. Get up like Peter and look into the matter. And I would be happy to help you do that. Reach out. I would love to connect with you one-on-one -on -one and talk with you about the resurrection. You know, the third response, moving from, you know, some people opposed it, some people investigated it. The third response is an important response for us evangelicals. Because the, the Easter story, the resurrection story, isn't just about finding an empty tomb. It's about finding an empty tomb and telling everybody that you know, everybody that you love, everybody that you associate with, that the tomb is empty. So the third response is that they share it. The three responses this morning that we look at, at in Scripture is some oppose it, some investigate it, and some share it. I'm back in Matthew chapter 28. The scripture says that the women who went early in the morning and found the tomb empty and had this incredible experience with this angel says, do not be afraid. Come and look. The tomb is empty just like Jesus said. Now go. The, the angel says, now depart and go and deliver the good news that the tomb is empty, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. So then in Matthew chapter 28, verse 8, the scripture says, and so the women departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell the disciples. So they left the empty tomb, and they ran to tell the disciples that Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. And you notice all the emotion there. It says, with fear and with great joy, in the midst of all the emotion they ran 
to tell the disciples. So this morning we finish our service by just highlighting there are really three biblical responses to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and to the empty tomb. Some people will oppose it. I hope that's not you. Some people will investigate it. And if that's where you're at, I would be happy to help you. Talk through, pray through, discuss and process. Is that tomb really empty? And the third response is share it. And I hope that if you have embraced the Lordship of Jesus Christ, that you've shared that, that you've told somebody in your life about the importance of the empty tomb. Just like Rick did, and just like Mike did, and just like Joe did, they shared how the empty tomb has personally impacted their life. Can I ask you to do something this morning as we close? If you have your notes and a pen that you like to make notes with, would, would you close our time this Resurrection Sunday by writing down the names of people that you would like to talk to about how the empty tomb has impacted your life? So if you would just take a second to do that, that would be such a strategic thing to do as we think about what would God have us do on this wonderful Easter morning. I think that God would have us do exactly what God had the first people who discovered the empty tomb do, which is share it with the people they know, and with the people that they love. Would you bow with me? Let's pray. Let's close our time together. Father, I just pray in the name of Jesus as we think through who it is that we need to share the story of the empty tomb and the way that it's impacted our life. I just pray that whatever obstacles we might have placed in our way, that those would be removed. Whatever fears we might have of talking about how the empty tomb has impacted our life, that those fears might be taken away from us by the power of your spirit. And Lord, as we've celebrated in this past hour and as we continue to celebrate today and even all of the Sundays of the year, uh, the resurrection, the empty tomb, the victory of you, Lord Jesus, over the confines and over the power of death, Lord, how we thank you that we not only are called to embrace it, but we're called to share it as well. And so, Lord, guide us, please, we pray in the name of Jesus. Guide us to be people of the story, people who not only know, but people who share as well. Thank you that the tomb is empty. Thank you that because you live, we can face tomorrow. Thank you that because the tomb is empty, we don't have to fear present circumstances. We give you thanks and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, God bless you, my friend, and we're glad that you were with us in our very different uh, Resurrection Sunday morning of 2020. If you're comfortable, would you place your hands out as we have our final blessing for the morning? And I want to read this blessing over you from the book of Numbers, the sixth chapter. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Lord, we go in peace because the tomb is empty. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. And don't forget, you are loved.